Hello and welcome to The Rep, Rugby's economic podcast. This is the show that looks at how money, power and politics impact the game we love, shining a floodlight on the challenges rugby faces as a global sport and offers suggestions on how they might be tackled. In our last run out, we discussed rugby's international appeal and how the game evolved through the characters and cultures who played it, from the Irish and the Aussies who relegated it below their own ball games to the Safas and Kiwis who wrapped their national identities up in their love of it. We saw how rugby colonised the colonies. Today we continue where we left off, with rugby now a global sport and the nations playing having dropped their arms on the battlefield and replaced them with an egg-shaped ball in the hunt of a new commodity, a little gold cup. Now we look at the birth of international tours, the politics of apartheid and the World Cup that nearly didn't happen. Let's kick off. With the expansion of the game throughout the colonies, rugby became an international juggernaut, played throughout the empire by the colonists and increasingly by the people they ruled over. It was finally decided in the early 1900s that the South Africans and New Zealanders were sufficiently good enough to tour the home nations for international games, which had already been played amongst the four home nations since the 1870s, but never had the Southern Hemisphere nations travelled north. And it was the 1905 New Zealand tour which highlighted how well the colonies had taken to rugby. The Kiwi side toured the UK and Ireland, France and even Canada stopping on the way home to play matches there. The originals as they became known played 35 games, <laughs> losing only one to Wales in Cardiff Arms Park. The significance of this match should not be overlooked, not only because the Welsh were the only team to have beaten the colonists on the tour, but also because it gives sport and rugby one of its greatest traditions the singing of national anthems at the beginning of games. The Welsh team, supported by a 47,000 strong crowd, responded to the haka by singing their anthem, Land of Our Fathers, to a notably shaken New Zealand side. In all, the originals finished the tour with a points tally of 976 and conceded only 59. Notable players on that tour included Irish-born captain Dave Gallagher, who had moved to New Zealand at the age of four with his family, and Bob Deans, great uncle to the Canterbury and All Blacks player Robbie Deans, who went on to coach Australia and the Bavarians. Upon the return to New Zealand, newly christened as the All Blacks because of their uniform, they were greeted to a hero's welcome and gave birth to an identity that has defined their nation ever since. However, it was not the home nations which gave these All Blacks their fiercest contest on the rugby pitch. This came from another British colony, South Africa. The Springboks, having also been given a nickname from their early 20th century tour of the home nations, were an altogether different prospect to the Kiwis. In New Zealand, the colonists embraced the local Maori people to improve the standard of the game, mixing the might of the Maori warrior spirit with the athletic abilities of the sport-loving colonists. They played an exciting brand of rugby. But in South Africa, under the policies of apartheid, white and black were strictly segregated. Rugby was no different. Springbok teams therefore consisted of a mixed white race of Afrikaners and British colonists. The result was a physical, bruising style of rugby, focused on forward dominance. This is a trend that is seen throughout the rugby world. Wherever the game went, the nations that adopted it made it uniquely their own, based on the attributes and skills of its people. No wonder why the Garyon kick originated in Ireland, or the French flair became the champagne rugby that we all love. By the 1960s, the world was going through a moment of change. In that decade alone, man had made it to space and to the moon, proving anything was possible. World leaders and activists were being assassinated, and the increasingly liberal public were protesting the injustices they saw in the world, namely the war in Vietnam, the rights of women and black people. All of this served as the backdrop to the Springbok tour of England in 1969, where the South Africans were greeted with mass protests against their apartheid policies at all of their matches. Influenced by the media, the protests followed the South African team home in 1974 when the British Lions tour was allowed to go ahead. There was a lot of criticism of this decision at the time. The members of the International Rugby Board, held up at the East India Club in London, believed politics and sport should be kept separate. Obviously, the Irish voices in the room held their tongue because that has never been our experience, and so the tour went ahead. On the pitch, the tour was an annihilation of the Springboks from the British Lions led by Irish lock Willie John McBride. Most noticeably on this tour was that black South African supporters were cheering for the Lions. They wanted the Springboks to lose. 
Before this point, the Springboks had never been beaten at home. In 1976, apartheid could no longer be ignored following the Soweto massacre, where more than 170 people, including children, were murdered at a school for protesting the mandatory use of Afrikaans. The world could no longer ignore the unjust policies of apartheid, and when the All Blacks visited South Africa in the same year, a global backlash followed. African members of the International Olympics Committee threatened to boycott the Olympics in 1976 if New Zealand were allowed to take part. New Zealand refused to step down and so 25 African nations recalled their athletes and didn't compete. Sport had become political. After this, the South African Rugby Board tried to recover by allowing visiting nations to have black players and also opened up the Springboks to black players for the first time. Errol Tobias, the first black Springbok, was practically shunned by the black community for being perceived as leaving them behind, whilst the SARB claimed the credit for being seen to have turned over a new leaf. In 1981, the Springboks visited New Zealand, but this tour was even more aggressive than the England tour of 1969. The Kiwis were hostile to the South African team with riots and protests following them for the duration of the tour. This culminated in the Eden Park showdown where spectators threw objects onto the pitch and even a low-flying plane dropped flower bombs onto the pitch. It was clear South African rugby was not welcome outside of South Africa as long as apartheid politics continued. Each week we meander a little off topic and back into the sheds for a blood sub and whilst the medics fix us up, we take the time to reflect on the happenings of the sport, a breather before we run back out to see out the game. This week we're looking at rugby's first World Cup, which nearly happened without the involvement of the International Rugby Board at all. In April 1980, the already crusty IRB rejected calls for a Rugby World Cup because it would impact future international tours and have undue strain on top players of a still amateur game. In reality, the UK and Irish officials were worried about diluting their sacred cash cow, the Five Nations. This was unbelievable to many in the game at the time who felt that a World Cup would have so many advantages for the players. A logical peak in the game for the players to aspire to, a way of deciding who's the best in the world, and an additional revenue which could be used to grow the game even further. Australian sports promoter David Lord saw the potential and tried to establish with financial backing a world tournament consisting of the best eight nations. This was quickly stopped by the RFU with their usual threats of lifetime bans from the sport for any players involved, but they couldn't ignore that there was a growing push, especially from the Southern Hemisphere, for a commercial global tournament. The IRB needed to get on that train as the New Zealand, South African and Australian unions had already left the station and were planning to host the World Cup. They conceded to a vote in 1985, which was carried, with only Ireland and Scotland voting against the proposition. Interestingly, rugby's outcasts at the time, South Africa, still had a vote and voted in favour of the tournament. This was later seen to be a bit of good business on the part of SARB chair Dan Craven, all but securing a future host spot for South Africa when apartheid eventually ended. Quite political from the non-political SARB. Hmm. South Africa were actually invited to the first Rugby World Cup by the IRB, now driving the train, but rejected when it became clear that the hosts, New Zealand and Australia, were not going to issue visas to their players. The tournament went ahead in 1987, despite some unease from the players in the Northern Hemisphere, who felt they were being asked to play a couple of times a week for games they didn't wholly want to be involved in and weren't greatly prepared for. In many ways, they felt as though they were being used to top up the IRB's bank account. And that they did. With a reported $1.6 million profit, a lot of money for a then amateur sport, Rugby World Cup was a huge success for the sport. More than half a million people attended the games throughout the tournament and more than 300 million people watched from home. What was abundantly clear from a rugby perspective though was that the tournament was a one-sided affair. You could tell that the Southern Hemisphere teams, especially the winning All Blacks, were fitter, stronger and just better than the rest of the nations. No doubt due to the extra training time they were allowed from their employers who were essentially paying them to play rugby. It was now a matter of when, not if, rugby would turn professional. Back in the UK, there was another form of apartheid continuing. This was the separation of amateur rugby union and professional rugby league. The Northern Union formed in 1895 when 22 clubs in the north of England separated from the RFU over the payment of concessions to working class players who suffered a loss of earnings to play the game. The RFU had a strictly amateur ethos and players or clubs suspected of professionalism could be banned from the game for life. In hindsight, this does seem quite hypocritical as the RFU started to make a lot of money from the game, especially as international rugby took off. 
After the tours of South Africa and New Zealand in 1905 and 1906, the RFU purchased the Cabbage Patch in Twickenham and started the construction of their own stadium. In 1907, the RFU purchased the land and Twickenham hosted its first game in 1909, featuring Harlequins vs Richmond. Twickenham played host to rugby's first live televised match in 1938 as England took on Scotland in that year's Calcutta Cup match. Check out our skip pass segment in episode 2 for our history and origins of this game and its legendary trophy. The advent of television brought rugby to new heights, growing further with widespread uptake of colour TV in the 1960s. For the first time, fans could see their favourite players as if in real life. The colour of the national jerseys and superstars of the game were being discovered. The only problem with all of this was that the RFU was pocketing all of the proceeds. As far as anyone could tell, amateurism was the elite's way of saying exploitation. This feel of dishonesty created an opportunity for Rugby League to start poaching Union's best players. This was a risky business to be involved in. Typically, Rugby League representatives would approach players after matches, handing them a note or a phone number, or send them unsolicited letters to their houses. Remember, if a player was seen talking to anybody from Rugby League, they could receive a lifetime ban, just for having a chat. The approach was straightforward. They would lure Union's players away with offers of riches beyond their wildest imagination. In fairness, they wouldn't have had to offer much, as Rugby Union was strictly amateur. Or was it? In upper-class rugby societies, payment didn't always mean physical money. Instead, it was commonplace for players to be afforded certain benefits like a job in the bank or the law firm. These were jobs which could still be undertaken when injured from playing rugby, of course. The same couldn't be said for the working classes. Most of these jobs involved manual labour, which would be at risk if you suffered an injury from playing rugby. In France and Italy, amateurism existed only on paper. In reality, players were lured from one village to the next to compete and further the sporting achievements of the parish. Such were the local rivalries that existed, especially in France. In Australia and New Zealand, something had to be done to stem the tide of players flocking from union to league. In New Zealand, All Black Jersey sponsor and beer producer Steinlager agreed to employ some of the players. They essentially were being paid to train and play rugby as salaried employees of Lion Breweries. Fast forward to 1995 and the political moves of the SARB had paid off. The third instalment of Rugby World Cup would be held in South Africa, the first major sporting event to be held there since the end of apartheid, only one year previous. In the spring of that year, a battle had been waging for the soul of Rugby League, between media magnate Kerry Packer, who held the TV rights for Australian Rugby League, and his rival Rupert Murdoch, who had set up Super League, a rival competition. Armed with checkbooks, Super League were approaching ARL and rugby union players to increase the attractiveness of their new product. To stop the raid on players, Packer backed retired Australian Ross Turnbull and the lawyer Jeff Levy's World Rugby Corporation, which aimed to sign up rugby union players to a new global professional franchise. This worried the Southern Hemisphere rugby unions who feared losing control of their stars to private money. So behind the scenes, they came to an agreement with Murdoch. At a press conference held at Ellis Park in Johannesburg, On the eve of the Rugby World Cup final, the South African, New Zealand and Australian rugby boards announced the Sanzar deal. This would see the creation of 12 professional rugby teams and a Tri-Nations test series, all paid for by a 555 million TV rights deal. At the same time, only metres away down on the Ellis Park rugby pitch, the All Blacks were having their captains run, quietly passing the ball back and forth between them. Amateurism was preparing for its final battle, and it didn't know it. South Africa would claim victory and be crowned Rugby World Cup champions for the first time. The immortal image of Francois Pinard receiving the Webb Ellis Cup from Nelson Mandela is seen by many as the moment when rugby turned professional. However, this is just another example of how rugby is written by the victors. A shame too, because I'm a rugby romantic. The reality is a little darker. As Springbok captain, Pinard was one of Packer's key recruiters in the World Rugby Corporation coup to take rugby union professional. The Trojan horse, well, Jazzy horse, he supported the recruitment of players throughout the Rugby World Cup with a reported 25 of the 28 South African squads signed up. An easy task considering the players were completely amateur. It wasn't until SARB president Lewis Lute got involved and convinced the players that South African rugby was all about playing for that jersey in that tournament and that they would never get that again, essentially threatening the players with the green and gold of South Africa. One side had tradition and real money behind it, the other had a vision and the promise of large paychecks. Tradition won out and the World Rugby Corporation project was dead in the water, despite having nearly 500 provincial and international players signed to it, 
Without the South African players and the opportunity to have the Springboks versus the All Blacks, it was a fruitless exercise. This is how close rugby union came to being split again over amateurism. It was the straw that broke the camel's back and by August 1995, the IRB announced the game would no longer be amateur. No, oh, there's the whistle and that's full time on this week's episode. As you've seen, rugby became a juggernaut and couldn't be stopped, despite the crusty IRB council members trying at every step to derail it. It took private money to force their hand in the end, but that didn't stop them trying to tell their own fairy tale about how it all happened. The economics are simple on this one. Once money is introduced, you get more players. More players means better competitions and more people want to watch the spectacle. That increases the money and the pie only gets bigger, ultimately appealing to commercial interest and creating global superstars. Rugby was no different. In our next head out, the reps opening the ledger on World Rugby to understand how the game functions, how it's financed and where the money gets spent. We're also going to look at rugby's biggest sponsorship deal. So until then, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you can, give us a rating or review and share with your mates. Go well.